Hey guys, this is Ed, Paul, and Anna of Current Brand Media, and we are here to tell you a little bit more about our sponsor. Sportsball is a great subscription service geared towards minor league baseball fans. Each box features a different minor league team. You get a box every three months with minor league baseball gear, including different styles of hats like Ed's favorite, the dad hat. The cost is less than $12 a month. Proceeds from each box goes to More Than Baseball, the only nonprofit dedicated to the well-being of minor league baseball players. We all know that Parents' Days are coming up this summer, so if you've got a mom or a dad or a grandma or a grandpa who are particularly difficult to buy for, but you know they're baseball fans, this is the answer, guys. Meet your new favorite team at sportsballbox.com. Is there anybody there? <laughs> You, get, you have to be a well-rounded person if you want to advance because it seems like in today's day and age, the only time you will ever to be able to focus on broadcasting and nothing else but broadcasting is when you're in the NHL, the NFL, MLB. That's it, when they're paying you to do just that. What's up, Deadhead Crew? Ed here. And on this episode, I give you guys TJ Shalot. He is the director of broadcasting with the Charlotte Checkers of the AHL. Uh, we talked about how he came up as a broadcaster, what he had to get through in order to get his foot in the door. Um, we also talked about a couple of words of advice that he gives, you know, people who are trying to get into the uh, the business of sports, right? Whether it's uh, broadcasting or uh, front office, anything. It, it's just some good um, word of advice to really follow on. And then, you know, so that way you can uh, follow your dreams like he's doing that. Okay. And then finally, you know, this already, we go into my famous, not so famous questions. So without further ado, guys, I give you guys the episode. All right. Well, I want to welcome you guys to yet another episode of the Dad Hat Chronicles. My name is Ed, uh, and with me today, I have the play-by-play caller for the Charlotte Checkers. Guys, this is not baseball. This is hockey, so get ready for this. I am so excited. TJ, how are you, my friend? I'm doing excellent, Ed. Thanks for having me on. Um, so the, the, the first questions I usually ask is how did you become a fan of the sports? I really want to know, you know, from your you know point of view, you're a hockey fan. How'd you become a fan? I, it was interesting for me. I grew up in Pennsylvania. I played baseball, basketball, football, all that good stuff. I followed my dad in, in pretty much every single sport, but the one sport he was not very versed in was hockey. And right around my preteen years early teen years i had a neighbor who was very big into hockey he grew up on hockey loved hockey and uh we would be playing out in the street and you know he kind of taught all the kids in the neighborhood how to play and some of the finer points of the game and from there i was kind of hooked and then i went into my high school years as a player and then i played in, in some beer leagues all the way up until i was about 28 years old or so and then uh it just was one of those sports that i was instantly drawn to once i started to learn about it and once i started to to kind of get the gist of the game and really pick up on those nuances that makes it as great as it is. It really is a lot of fun. I I am a fan, you know, I haven't been a fan for a long, long time, right? I I actually picked it up a, a few years ago uh, when I lived in Ohio. And it's one of those sports that it is a lot more exciting being live right you know you're there you you feel the 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 players you know checking each other on the boards and things like that so it's a lot exciting but what a lot of people don't really get is is, is the excitement that you get with a play by play caller when you're watching the game or listening to them because your job is to you know uh, visualize the game for us if we're listening to on the radio which that's a lot of work my friend it's tough. I mean, it's a fast sport, right? I mean, I always look at it this way, though. I would much rather be in a sport where there's so much going on that I'm just rapid fire talking because I think that kind of fits my personality, my skill set a little bit better, rather than a sport where I feel like I'm pulling teeth and I'm trying to just find things to talk about. And sometimes that happens in hockey. I mean, every now and then you'll get your occasional blowout game, whether you're on the winning side or the losing side of that game. It's still the pace of the game 
game is going to change because you're not going to keep saying the score is 10 to one or anything like that. Or, you know, there's games in the playoffs that go into two overtimes, three overtimes, four overtimes, where you have to start filling a lot of your time with stories and anecdotes and, you know, different things to keep people engaged because they're going to keep listening. They want to hear that next goal, but you don't know yeah. when. So you got to be prepared for that and you got to kind of keep people on the hook so that they don't flip it off. It's true. Right. And it's, and it goes for all sports, right? At some point, you know, you have to, I think that the, the preparation takes over at that point, right. You know, skills that, you know, you already, you know, that's like skills that you've already developed along the way that it takes over and you're like, okay, so I, I, I have a list of things that I can talk about when this, the game gets very um, monotonous, let's just say for that, for the lack of a better word. Yeah. And fortunately for hockey, even when it's, monotonous so to speak always something going on i mean it could be a 10 to 1 game but there's always going to be a big save or there's going to be a big shot or a hit or a fight especially in those 10 to 1 games you know tempers tend to flare teams are getting frustrated so there's always something right around the corner um it's interesting in that regard that even when it is 10 to 1 it's not too too monotonous but right where you're going to hit those valleys and you're going to stay in those valleys in terms of excitement for a little bit. Very true. Uh, it's not like baseball or like football when it gets very monotonous is because, you know, it, they the tempers do flare up a little bit when there's that blow up game and you're like, all right, here we go. I'm I'm expecting a fight sometime soon. Something is going to happen because, you know, listen, either I don't want to get embarrassed or I don't want my team to get embarrassed. So I'm going to go out and defend my team no matter what. Exactly right. Now, let me ask you, because you say you, you know, that's 28 years old, um, you, you, that's when you really started picking up the nuances of hockey and everything. So what led you from, from that to now, you know, calling games, you know, for the checkers? Um, I, I'm an interesting story. I have a really interesting path. I, I was I was in high school kind of when I started to learn the nuances when I started to play and I played up until I was about 28. And the reason I stopped playing uh, when I was 28 was because calling hockey games became a full-time job for me. So I was traveling around the country. I originally started out, I was a car salesman for eight years um, from the time I was 20 until I was 28. I was working at a dealership. I kind of figured that was going to be my my life. That was going to be my career path. I went to college at a small community college where I did study radio and TV production, but I never was able to get my foot in the door. I also didn't try all too hard um, Mm -hmm. looking had tried harder, I might have been able to get a foot in the door earlier. But for me, um, I was it was 2015. I was driving home from work one night and I was listening to the local radio station, just listening. I think it was a Monday night football game. And I was listening to the game, driving home. I had a half hour commute and coming on during one of the commercials, that local ESPN radio station was looking for someone to push buttons back behind the scenes. And it was only two days a week. And both of those days that they were looking for someone happened to coincide with my days off. So I'm sitting there going, I could work seven days a week if two of those days are just, you know, at a radio station doing kind of monotonous work to bring that word back up. But, you know, if I'm just pushing buttons, I'll be very happy, even if I'm only making minimum wage. That'd be really cool. That's a foot in the door. And that's exactly what I did. I was fortunate enough to get that job. So I worked both jobs, a car sales job and uh, worked at the radio station for a while. And slowly but surely, a you know producer job behind the scenes turned into some on-air work, which led to an internship in my hometown with the Lehigh Valley Phantoms, who are right here in the American Hockey League. And now one of our biggest opponents every single year. I so was that- just going to say, isn't that an opponent from you guys? It's very, yeah, it's it's pretty unique where I was living. As a matter of fact, when I had that internship, this would have been uh, the season of 2016, uh, 2015-16, excuse me. I was living directly across the street from the arena. So I would walk across the street to go do games and go do the internship and work with Bob Rochuk, their radio voice, and kind of learn the ins and outs of how to broadcast hockey. I kind of knew the sport from my time playing. I didn't play at a very high level, though, so I didn't know a lot of, you know, the really in-depth stuff and i didn't know the first thing about how to broadcast it you know when to talk when not to talk all those little you know little nuances and little Mm -hmm. techniques working with bob in the american hockey league for the phantoms was very cool and now we get to go back there twice a year just about and we stay at the hotel that's looking back across the street at my old apartment and it's just it's very unique and it's very surreal and to be able to go home and see my friends and family twice a year is always nice too 
That's awesome. That's cool though. Like, I mean, and, and what's, what I like about your story is that you say it's like, you know what? It's never too late to do what exactly what you love, to follow your passion. Right. Yeah. And, and that's 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 amazing. First of all, I uh, I really do appreciate that. So as someone who's doing this now as a, you know, for podcasting and things like that, like you, I was like, I really wanted to get into sports. You know, I wanted to go into radio. Uh, that never really happened when I was in Cleveland. And then, you know, pandemic happened and then I found this. So, you know, I'm I'm, I'm on the right path. So thank you for that. <laughs> Keep trying. You never know. I mean, it's so funny how little things can change your life. In my case, it was a commercial that I happen to be paying attention to because I think back to those, you know, 9, 15, 9, 30 at night drives home listening to the radio. I'm not listening to the actual commercial 99% of the time. Why did I hear that one commercial or what about it caught my attention? And from there, it, it literally snowballed. And even, you know, you talk about people that come into your lives and mm. how they when I was working at the radio station, I was so happy just selling cars, working at the radio station, being behind the scenes. And someone had come up to me and said, why don't you try play by play? He's a good friend of mine now, Phil Constantino. He's actually here in Charlotte uh, working for Gardner Webb University. And he's like, why don't you try play by play? And I'm like, I wouldn't know where to start. And he kind of gave me the blueprints of putting together a demo and going and I did a double A baseball game and just got some stuff down, you know, on tape so I could spread that around and I could start to kind of get my name out there. And ultimately, that demo that I did at that baseball game led to the internship with the Lehigh Valley Phantoms. And then that led to my first job in South Haven, Mississippi, just outside of Memphis and single A hockey. So it, it just kind of it's those things where if he never said that to me, who knows i could still be selling cars and just pushing buttons at the radio station hosting an afternoon show and, and being more than happy with that but you never know what's on the other side it's, it, it, which uh double a team did you uh do the uh the the play-by-play -play? it was the reading phillies they're, they're now the the fighting phils the fighting phillies yeah the fine phils that's awesome phillies i mean they were only an hour and a half outside of where we lived and originally uh the lehigh valley iron pigs are there in allentown as well that's where yep. i want we were the flagship station. Um, our ESPN station was the flagship for them. And I figured I know these guys like they can make room for me in the booth. And Phil, the guy who had recommended that I try to get a tape goes, don't don't bother a triple A team. They're not going to necessarily going to want to squeeze you in. They might do it. But just go to double A. It's a lot less crowded. They got a lot more room. It's an hour and a half. And I remember that recording. I really didn't know what I was doing with audio. You know, when you look at your podcast setup there, you have the mic hooked up in into the computer and XLR cables and you have headphones. <laughs> and I didn't have any of that. Um, I think the demo itself was the audio was being recorded off of my laptop mic. So it sounded like I was kind of underwater. I was barely coming through. And I remember like just I, I, I didn't know any of the players because I was just handed a roster sheet before I got there. They're playing the Portland Sea Dogs. I'll never forget this game. I remember doing like a half inning and just being I'm exhausted like this is this is insanely intense. And I'm like, but it's fun. But I was just like, man, if this was a real radio broadcast, like I'd need to tap out and have somebody come in because I'm just I don't know what to say, when to say it. Um, I was messing up, you know, looking down at my notes and then looking up and completely losing the ball. Like, where did it go? Like <laughs> it, it was very, you know, that's where you start. That's where you, you that's where you begin. And that for me, that's where it was. And ultimately that demo, it worked. I mean, between my studio work that I had under my belt and my hosting work, um, you know, for the, the afternoon drive show and that demo, that's what got me the internship. And from there it was just like, you know what? No, play by play is my thing. I'm going for it. And I'm going to, I'm going to go. That's awesome. Uh, you know, first of all, so my very first, you know, re recording when that I did, you know, when I started doing the podcast compared to now, Right. Oh, my God. Like, you know, night and day. So I as soon as you said that, I'm like, oh, my God, I remember being so nervous and like, you know, fumbling over my words and all of that. So I'm with you, my friend. I'm with you. It's something I tell younger broadcasters all the time um, who are trying to advance and stuff. I still have that recording. I will still listen back to it and laugh because I, I think it gives you a good perspective on how far you've come. So when you're sitting there, I, I like to tell a lot of young broadcasters, and it's something I do myself, is I critique myself all the time. I am my own worst critic. I can't tell you how many times I'll come home and my girlfriend will be like, you had a great game tonight, and I'm just 
no, like I miss this. I miss this. I miss this. I'm, I'm very hard on myself. And I think it's a good thing because I'm striving for perfection. I'm going to keep going until I get it. But when you can look back at something that was just that God awful from your first (laughs) and then listen to a game that you think was pretty bad and compare the two, it kind of, you sit there and you go, you know what? No, that, that game was not that bad at all. I'm being way too hard on myself. Remember where you came from. You've made gigantic strides. So it's something that I tell a lot of, you know, I get emails from kids that are in college who want some demo critiques or they want some tips and things like that. And that's always one of them. Like, don't forget how far you've come. Cause I think sometimes we get too caught up in the chase. Like the college kids want to get their first play by play job. And then the guys that have their first want to get their second in the next level. Same thing for me. One day I would love to be in the nhl so i'm going to keep working until i can get there but every now and then you have to stop and look back and go this is how far i've come keep doing it you're on the right path and and you are you are with uh, a really good organization you know here in north carolina being that is the you know the charlie checkers used to be affiliated with a, an nhl team here in north carolina now in florida so it's it's you know your path is there it's just like you said, we just got to stop sometimes and really embrace w- the, how far along you've come or, you know, what you've done so far, because that's how that's why you got here to where you're at. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be, you know, in, in broadcast, it can be anything, no matter what your mm-hmm. career. Just look back. If you've been at the same company for 10 years, just when was the last time you thought about your first day and logging into your email for the first time and, you know, having a problem come up and and being kind of scared with that paper? Like, do I do I bring this up to the boss or do I not? You know, all that stuff that you instinctively do now without even thinking there was a time where you really had to stop and, you know, you were filled with anxiety, you were filled with emotion, how to handle it, maybe a little nervousness or scared even think back to that and how far you've come. And I mean, you can go just as far again on top of where you already are if you just keep working at it. That's absolutely correct, my friend. Absolutely correct. So let me ask you then, um, you it, you started with the checkers. How was that process of, you know, because I know that a lot of people say, I was like, oh, I, I you know, this is my job now, but I, I'm very intrigued by the process of, you know, applying, uh, you know, interviews, because it's a little different than a regular job, like, you know, salesman or, you know, insurance or anything like that. That Play by play is a little bit different than than a lot of other jobs. Yeah, it, it, it certainly is. And the one thing about all of my play by play jobs is I've had something else in my job title that I was responsible for. Uh, my very first full time play by play job was with the Mississippi River Kings and the SPHL. I was play by play broadcaster and also responsible for community development. So I would go out with the mascot, do the kids events, go to the churches, the schools, that kind of thing. Uh, My second job after the River Kings, I was there for a year when they ultimately closed their doors. I went up to Minnesota. I was working in junior hockey with the Austin Bruins. There, I was a jack of all trades, everything from handling tickets to uh, corporate sales, you know, the people that are on the dashers and in the arena, along with play by play. And then here in Charlotte is, is a very similar role to what I had in Minnesota, just a lot more fine-tuned um so you always have to be prepared for that but the play-by-play process it's a little different for each team but the one thing that's different and maybe this isn't as different in today's post-covid world where you know video conferencing like this is so common but i remember one of the very first video conferences i ever did was trying to get that job with the mississippi river kings um because i was in pennsylvania where i'm from they were in Mississippi. So it's not one of those things where I'm flying down for an interview or things along those lines. The first step in the process is obviously finding uh, finding a team that you want to work for, finding a potential employer, and then sending them your resume and your demo. And your demo is going to usually be somewhere from five to 10 minutes long, a, a cut of play so that they can hear what you're like in a normal game, you know, include a goal call, stuff like that. It's just like a portfolio for an artist or a graphic designer or anything like that. And if they like you and they like what's on your resume, they'll call you. Um, and from there, it was my very first video conference. I had two of them uh, with that team. I had the first one was with the GM who was doing the hiring. And the second was with the head coach because he wanted to have some say um, just as the GM of the team and make sure that the person they were hiring was a good fit for him and, and for the locker room culture, because that's the one thing with being a play-by-play broadcaster. And if there is any play-by-play broadcaster who's listening 
in on this podcast, they will tell you the same thing. You're in a unique position as a play-by-play broadcaster because you're technically business ops. So you're working in the front office with the corporate salespeople, the ticketing people, PR, all that stuff. But then when you go out on the road or during practices and things, you're hockey ops. You're hanging out, you know, with the nutritionist, with the strength and conditioning coach, with the video coach, the players, they see you kind of as one of them. So you fit into these two different boxes at the same time. So that was the purpose of having two different people interviewing. Um, My second job when I was going to Minnesota, that was just all done over the phone. They liked the resume. They liked what I had to offer. They made me an offer and I needed something because I didn't have a net, you know, the team behind me folded. So I was like, okay, this looks like it's going to fit. And honestly, it was a great three years. I was in junior hockey. I learned an entirely different world uh, of hockey and how things operate and it got me more prepared for when i ultimately did come here to charlotte and dealing with players a lot of the players who are on this team come from the world of junior hockey so now i can them in that regard i can tell them about my time they can tell me about their time and even some guys i come across were on the same team maybe not when i was there but in austin and spent some time there that's awesome i like that and I, I like that you says like, you know what? We're a jack of all trades. And is that is true on any minor league sport, not just hockey or basketball, baseball. It's like minor league overall, you are, in, yes, you're the play by play caller, but you're also doing, you know, X, Y, and Z as well, because you got to, that's, you know, that's, there's a limited budget to a minor league team. I'm confident in saying this. I mean, if there's anyone in our Charlotte Checkers front office who's listening to this and they disagree, they can let me know. But I'm confident in saying that one of the key reasons why I got this job here in Charlotte is because of my sales background. The position that they had posted was a play-by-play broadcaster and corporate sales manager. So someone who can sell all of the ads in the arena, sell ads on the broadcast all of that stuff because they needed to fill both of those roles and coming out of, again, a post COVID world, it became a situation where they said, let's try and find someone who can do both of those things and fill both of those roles. It's obviously more cost effective on the team's end. And with the way, like you said, the way all of minor league sports is, it's becoming more and more prevalent. So it's not going to be necessarily hard to find a whole slew of candidates that have both of those necessary skill sets. So I know for a fact that, you know, the since I was in Minnesota, I was the only front office member for my last year that I was there. I did all of that stuff. I designed all the dasher boards. I sent them all to the printers. I hung them up myself. So having that kind of background and coming here, it's all things that in smaller portions and little tiny elements I've done here. I like that. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. And if you're, if you're not a jack of all trades, you need to become one in order for you to become more marketable to other teams. Also something that, you know, that has stuck with me with a lot when I'm talking to other people is you must be willing to travel. If you want to follow your dreams, you must be willing to travel and move to all the parts of the, of the country in order for you to, you know, fulfill that dream. A thousand percent. And I remember, you know, when radio became my career path. When it clicked in my mind that car sales is eventually going to be done and I'm going to be in radio, I was like, you're going to have to move. If you want to do play by play, you're going to have to move. And that's just the way, the way it goes. It's absolutely the way it goes. And you have to be ready for that. The only guy I can think of that really has never had to move would be Anthony LaPanta, who is the play by play voice of the Minnesota wild. He grew up in Minneapolis, St. Paul, went to college at the University of Minnesota, got a job right out of college for the local TV station. So he was a sports anchor on TV and then parlayed that into a play-by-play job with the Wild. So he never had to leave. That is so, so, so rare. He's the only person I know of uh, who's ever been able to pull that off. So you have to be willing to travel. You have to be willing to learn new skills. I remember when I first got to uh, Minnesota myself, I didn't have a very strong background in graphic design or video production, but as the only front office guy, they relied on me to get that kind of stuff done, those highlights to get done, those dasher boards to get designed and program ads and all that stuff. So, you know, I started taking some classes online and just trying to, you can find anything on YouTube these days. You have to work just as much on your broadcasting. You have to work on your other skill sets, whether it's graphic design, video production, some kind of technical thing. You get, you have to be a well-rounded person if you want to advance, because it seems like in today's day and age, 
the only time you will ever to be able to focus on broadcasting and nothing else but broadcasting is when you're in the NHL, the NFL, MLB. That's it. When they're paying you to do just that. It's true. Like if if you're if you're not in one of those major sports, you're going to have to do a lot of other things, wear a lot of hats because that's how it goes. Like, for example, I, a couple of friends that are GMs in minor league baseball, they says like, oh, yeah, we go out and pull the tarp as well because oh, yeah. we don't have a, a, a team that can do that for just that, you know, on a game. I'm the one that does that as well. That's right. So be willing to be willing to wear hats. There as you go. All behind you. You got to wear them. That's true. Now let's talk about a little bit about the checkers because the checkers are, uh, they're a very interesting team, right? Because they're not, they, they've been around since 1990 um, when they started back in New York and then, you know, excuse me, I apologize. Uh, and then they moved again, right? Cause they were the, uh, the, the capital district Islanders They became the river brats. And then they came down to Charlotte after that. Um, they this team right now, like we were just talking earlier, they are a uh, an affiliate of the Florida Panthers. But before, you know, during that little bit of time period, they were an affiliate of two teams. That's right. Yeah, last season. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? I, I'm very intrigued about this one. Yeah. So last year was our first year as the primary affiliate of the Florida Panthers uh, after being with the Carolina Hurricanes for a number of years. We had gone dormant for the 1920 year, so we come back and we're with the Florida Panthers. And because of the pandemic and because of everything going on with supply chain issues, the Seattle Kraken, who had a team coming in for the Coachella Valley Firebirds, their AHL affiliate, of course, the Kraken, the newest NHL team to come on the scene, they needed an AHL affiliate. They planned on putting them in Coachella Valley in Southern California, but because of supply issues, COVID, they couldn't get the arena finished on time, and it was becoming increasingly, increasingly uh, more obvious that they weren't going to be able to have their team there. They were going to have to share an affiliation. And through the Seattle Kraken's GM and Ron Francis, who used to be yeah. with the Hurricanes, through that relationship that he had with the Checkers, it was an easy thing for them to reach out and say, hey, would you be willing to bring on our guys as well as part of a dual affiliation? Of course, that had to go through Florida. They were our prime affiliate. They are our prime affiliate now for this season and you know going forward for the foreseeable future. They had to approve that, and ultimately they did. And it was a very unique setup. For instance, we had head coach Jordy Kinnear. He was appointed by Florida. He's been in the Florida organization. This will now be his sixth season as head coach of the Florida affiliate, uh, whether it be Springfield or here in Charlotte. But we also had our assistant coach, which was Stanley Cup winning former head coach Dan Bilesma from the uh, Pittsburgh Penguins. He was our assistant coach because he was assigned by the Seattle Kraken. The Kraken pretty much knew he was going to be their head coach once that arena and everything moved out to california so let's get him in there to charlotte work with at least some of the guys get to know some of the guys tendencies the ones that are going to be coming to california and that's exactly what happened and it was a very unique situation because you have two different coaches both veterans of the game of hockey both very successful in their own right kind of teaching two different systems because you know florida runs one way at the nhl level seattle runs a different way at the nhl level they have two different head coaches at those levels so they have different systems and they want their guys that they call up to be smart and to be aware of those systems so that when they do get called up to the show they can slot into the lineup and they can increasingly be important to the team and really just step right in and go but down at the checkers level, you have to balance both of those. And they did a fantastic job of doing so. Checkers finished with a record of 42, 24, 5, and 1. Ended up winning the division, going into the third round of the playoffs. They earned a first round bye. So it was really a testament to how those two coaches balanced what their demands were from their own parent clubs and got this team moving forward. That is that is extremely hard to do because I'm trying to figure out if that can be ever be done in other sports because is right. You have two, like you said, like two very different um, ways of running a, an organization and, in, and for them to really work together and to mesh during that season. I mean, that's kudos to everybody, both the Seattle and the Florida Panthers for saying, yeah, let's help each other out. Let's see how this is going to go. And, you know, and obviously it went really well for the, for everybody. 
Yeah, and kudos to the players, I mean, in the leadership group, just because, you know, no one came in with a bad attitude saying, you know, like, oh, man, if we, the Florida guys, for instance, man, if we if we didn't have these Kraken guys, I'd be starting or I'd be on this line or none of that didn't exist. You know, I mean, the, the leadership built up a culture that it was just I, I heard head coach Jordy Kinnear say this, and it stuck with me throughout the entire season. We're not the Florida Panthers. We're not the Seattle Kraken. We're the Charlotte Checkers. And that sentiment came through the locker room every single day. Some of those guys became best friends, even though they're not going to be playing on the same team this year because they're on opposite ends of the country. Exactly. So, uh, you know, kudos to the coaching staff, to the relationships that that they helped nurture, and, of course, the leadership group who – turn that team you wouldn't know i mean if you didn't know the first thing about hockey or affiliations you would just all assume every single player on that team was all best friends and just all part of the same organization it was just one organization that's amazing that's and like i said kudos to everybody for really you know going above and beyond and really making you know the nhl because it and, and is a very fast growing sport the nhl right right now it's the the popularity of it has become um very important here in, in, in the U.S., you know, obviously in Canada is very, very popular, but here in the U.S. is obviously you have the NFL, you know, and all of that. But and it's I, I'm a fan. I mean, I'm I'm a kid who was born in Puerto Rico. Right. I'm you know, it's not a sport that you would automatically would think that a Puerto Rican will be liking. But I absolutely love the hockey. Yeah, it's starting to grow. I mean, you're seeing areas like Charlotte. This is a not a traditional hockey market, you know? You think of hockey markets, you think where I was before in Minnesota. You think of upstate New York, the Uticas, the Rochester, Syracuse. Those are hockey markets, but it's starting to spread. I mean, Charlotte, we were sixth in attendance last year, and that's not only because of the interest in this area, but also the hard work that everybody behind the scenes puts on to make it such an exciting show, to make it such a good value for families. All that played into why we drew so well last season. It's something we're obviously going to try and continue to do this year, but it's becoming more and more popular in these pockets, and ultimately those pockets start to spread, and a lot of it can be you know, really pinpointed on the NHL. When you look at teams like the Tampa Bay Lightning with the success that they've had sustained over the last three to five years, all of a sudden young kids want to start playing hockey in Florida. And that slowly grows the game because the parents will get interested because the kids are interested because they're seeing their friends with lightning sweaters and all this other stuff. And the same thing could be, could be said for, you know, Vegas. That's not a traditional hockey market. Look at what they've got going on. All of a sudden, things are starting to grow, and you're starting to see D1 college programs pop up in these non-traditional areas. Our goaltender from last year, Joey Decord, went to Arizona State. He's from Boston. Why Why would he want to leave Boston to go to Arizona State? He, he can tell you the answer to that, but that's a D1 program because it's starting now in the Southwest U.S. to really kind of grow. Same thing with Coachella Valley, Southern California. It's really starting to spread. And if they can continue to get the kids interested, if we can continue to get the adults interested, it'll continue to grow. That's that's very interesting. And, and I I'm something that I have noticed that, you know, the NHL and, you know, AHL has done is um, it really embraced diversity because that's something that if you want to grow, diversity is a, a very important aspect of that. For sure. For sure. Because, you know, it's a tough game to get into in general, you know, when you talk about the cost, when you talk about how expensive ice is and, and the equipment and things like that, the last thing that you want to have is a hurdle that is so just what are we doing here? Like it, to have a hurdle because your skin color is this or your view is that it, it is just a waste of everyone's time. Get that out of the game. You know, it, it's hard enough to for kids to find ice that's close by. It's hard enough for kids to get involved and and to just play the game. They shouldn't have to deal or or adults or anyone at that level. They shouldn't have to deal with they can't play because of this barrier or because they believe this or they look like that. It's just garbage and it just needs to leave. I completely and one hundred percent agree with you, my friend. I think that's a very important. Uh, and like I said, I am a huge fan of hockey. You know, and it's and it's grown over the years, right? I, I lived in Ohio for so long, and you know, we had the Blue Jackets down in Columbus. You know, I became a fan of the Minnesota Wild when they were there, right? And at the same time, really embraced um, the Carolina Hurricanes when I moved here. So it's like. 
uh, and it's and it's they are embracing everything all over the country and I, i'm 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 so so thankful for that and you know uh, and i'm thankful for you guys because you guys are an nhl team here in north carolina as well right yeah, you know, we're the American Hockey League affiliate of the Florida Panthers, and we're proud to say that coming in fe- February, on uh, right now scheduled on the 10th, we're going to have Hockey is for Everyone, which is exactly that. Hockey is for Everyone, it's something we do every year um, in one way, shape, or form. It might be called something different, but there's always an inclusion night every single year because it's just it's something that means something to us. We know that it means something to the community of hockey. The NHL does something very similar. So it's just something that we absolutely we feel we have to do it every single year. That is us doing our jobs to to remind folks of inclusion and to help grow the game. Ultimately, that's what we're here for is to grow the game of hockey. And we're not going to do that if we're not including everyone. I agree 100 percent. Let me ask you uh, just to shift a little bit. um, You guys now are, you know, there's no affiliation with Seattle. You guys are Florida Panthers. You guys that you know that is going forward, you know, into the future, uh, you know, the, the color scheme and everything that you guys had still have right now is very similar to what the Carolina hurricanes have. Is there any plans of eventually uh, doing a little bit of shift or you guys want to become, be very independent, but still be, you know, partners with the, the Florida Panthers organization. We're very independent. I I think uh, the misconception there is we're red and white because of the hurricanes. Mm -hmm. And I'd have to ask around. I'm not really sure what came first, the chicken or the egg there. Um, But for us, red and white is our identity. And it's our identity, not because of us formerly being with the hurricanes. It's our identity. So we kept it. You know, last season, I don't have a jersey around here, but last season, our, we paid homage to the Florida Panthers with a patch on the shoulder. It was a, just a gray and black patch. It's going to be something similar this season, I would imagine. I haven't seen the new uniforms just yet, but, you know, I can't speak for the people that meet, make those decisions, but I don't see any kind of major change coming from the, the red and white or the red, black and white scheme that we have. I mean, we announced our third jerseys which is an interesting story in itself which is just a black and red uniform as well and that's just kind of our identity that's who we've become regardless of who we're affiliated whether it's florida seattle carolina or whoever else i mean there was a time where the checkers were affiliated with the new york rangers when they were back in the echl days so um you know the team has kind of gone up and down over different um you know different courses and different paths in their history, but red and white, that's our identity. That's who we are. There is one logo that I do love that, you know, is the, um, the crown logo. Yes. That's the third, uh, the new, (laughs) how that, so that, how that started. I don't know if you read up on the story, uh, back in 2019, 20, when we were dormant for the season, April fools rolled around And the team got together and the graphic designer, Zach Harvey, he's an absolute brilliant, he's he's a genius, came up with the idea that we were going to announce a rebrand, but we weren't going to announce a rebrand like we were going to become the Charlotte Pelicans or anything weird like that because it would be too obvious for, for April Fool's. He just decided to lean into the checkers part of the game. And when, when we say checkers, like the game of checkers, you know, a not checkered flag, which is one of the main reasons we're called the checkers. Cause we're here in NASCAR country outside of Charlotte, the checkered flag, right? Checkers being a hockey term too. you check in someone, but to lean into the game. So that design, he came up with this uniform. It's a black uniform with a big red stripe. Uh, the crown logo is actually belongs to the city. That is their, Um, the city of Charlotte's logo. You see it on street signs, you see it on work trucks, things like that. So we asked them for their permission to use it in the logo that kind of looks like a checker. Um, And that's kind of how that, that whole thing played down because you have Kings and checker, you have Queens and checkers, Charlotte, the queen city. It just kind of worked. People thought we were serious. Like it went viral. The video is fantastic. It's on YouTube. Anyone just just search Charlotte Checkers, find our page. It's one of the most watched videos. It was fantastically done. I mean, it was sold so well to the point where people were craving those uniforms. They were dying to see the ice. So we made them last year as a one-off and they did so well. 
they did fantastically well that they're now going to be our third jersey this season. We're going to wear them for every Friday home game throughout the year. That's amazing. You know, and it's something that was supposed to be a joke. And you're like, you know, guys, we do have something here. Like, I mean, yeah. we, we really got something cooking here. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think there's a lesson there. Just listen to your fans. I mean, they're not going to have great opinions all the time. Nobody does. But when, you know, when you're getting strong kickback like that, where people are like, this is really good. Like this is, they're on, the, you got to kind of do it. And that right now it's our, it's hanging up in our, we have one hanging up in our office here because we thought it was just going to be a one-off. We have a, a few, you can see a couple behind me of just specialty jerseys that we've done over the years, or in the case of the blue one that I guess is over my left shoulder here. That's old. That is very old. You're going back into the seventies. I think uh, they don't even have a nameplate on it, but we have that one here because we thought it was just going to be a specialty Jersey. And, and here we are. And it's going to be our every Friday night alternate. Love it. Absolutely love it. And uh, I, as a fan, obviously you can see behind me, I have a few dad hats. So I am going to make sure that, you know, I want to ask, you know, put it out there for you guys, guys got to give me some dad hats, you know, for in that. And I will make sure to get one because that's, that is a beautiful logo. And for being an April fool's joke, you know, something like that. And it's, it, you guys, knocked it out of the ballpark you know on that one so that congratulations on that on that mistake that happened to be a really good one you know it, it was just it was a perfect storm i think because of the fact that it was during a year we weren't playing you know i mean april fools april 1st is usually the last week or two of the regular season right so normally people who would make those decisions and who would design something like that are you know, up to here and in, in things that they got to do. So they can't really put that much effort into it. But the fact that, you know, it was an off season for us, they had plenty of time to shoot it, you know, got things done probably a month in advance. I'd have to ask him to find out the truth on that, but I'm sure they had plenty of time to work it through. And it was brilliantly done by, by Tara Black, our COO and, and Zach Harvey, our, our head of creative. So it was really well done. And, and here we are. And to embrace Queen City, right? Like, I mean, you you want your team, whatever whatever team sport, whatever sport it is, you want them to embrace the the city, right? And to embrace it in a way which, you know, makes sense. Like you said, checkers, the actual game checkers. And, you know, you have a queen there and all of that. Love it. I think it's great. Uh, so congratulations on that. Um, I have one last question before we go into our famous, not so famous questions here uh, is any word of advice for people who are looking to get into, um, you know, play by play or, you know, really get into the, the business of, of sports. The first thing you have to do if you want to get into play by play or the world of sports is you need to make sure that you've got yourself positioned so that when an opportunity arises, you can jump on it. You know, there was a time when I was working at the radio station and I was just getting started. I was in my first year where a couple opportunities came up and I jumped at them and I was like, ah, that's my next spot. That's my next thing. I was not ready for that. You know, they didn't call me back for the interview. They 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 didn't do anything. They just politely declined a couple of baseball teams because I thought maybe that would be the way that I would go. But I was not ready for it. And it wasn't until I got my first job with Mississippi where I realized the reason I got the job was because I had my house kind of in order. You know, I knew what my skill set was. I knew that I was ready for that next step. I think too many people think that they can just take giant leaps and get to where they want to be. It's it's going to happen slowly, slowly, but surely. If you're interested in getting into the front office side of things, you want to work as a graphic designer, you want to sell tickets or something like that, you have to know where to look. You have to make sure that you're on all of the right job boards, like teamwork online. You have to make sure that you're not only checking out those job boards, but also individual teams uh, pages. Sometimes they don't go to like a monster or to an indeed or even LinkedIn. They just post on their own website. And if you're not visiting their website to see it, you won't know. And in other situations, my here's a perfect me here in Charlotte. This was not an open job. It wasn't out there. There's a very large for anybody who's interested in getting into broadcasting. There's a very large or any kind of TV hosting a very large job board. It's called the Sportscasters Talent Agency of America. It's actually more than just a job board. It's a lot of communicative stuff between play by play and just learning tips and tricks and things like that. This job wasn't on there. 
And that's where I had gotten every job before. Like I saw my Mississippi job on STAA. I got the job. I saw the job in Minnesota on STAA. I got the job. This one was just an email because I had heard through the grapevine that their old guy, Jason Shia, who's now up in Utica, I had heard that he got that job in Utica. And I was like, well, okay, Utica's obviously not open, but Charlotte must be. And my timing was right. The day that I decided to send the email just happened to be the week that they were conducting interviews. So it just it just it worked and do i believe in fate absolutely i think that had a lot to do with it but at the end of the day you have to be ready for that and you have to be looking for that if i didn't send that email or i didn't have that thought well you know jason's in utica now so charlotte's open then i would never have applied i never would have reached out um it's those things you have to make sure that you're doing the normal stuff searching the job boards searching twitter if you see someone left and also, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's going on under the surface that you have to reach out for. So, you know, look at yourself, take a hard look at yourself, know your skill set, know what you're really good at, know what you're really not good at, and start to plan out steps to get better at that. And make sure you keep your eyes open. If you want to get in sports, it's all about keeping your eyes open. Send an email to someone, even if the job is taken. I've had a number of people, because my title here is Director of Broadcasting, I've had a number of people reach out to me and ask if the checkers are looking for a play-by-play broadcaster. That's me, because... <laughs> They think that I'm just, you know, I'm a manager of some kind and that I'm hiring different play-by-play -play positions and overseeing the whole broadcasting department when in reality it's it's a little different than that. I always respond to them and let them know, no, we're not looking for someone. It is in fact me. But those are the kind of people that I really respect because they're out, they're looking, they're trying. They're not seeing a play-by-play -play broadcaster listed directly on the Checkers website. So they're assuming there is not one and they're reaching out and it's that kind of hard work, that kind of sleuthiness that that might end up playing into your favor if you're looking to get into this game. It's true. And you never know. Like you said, it's like you just sent that email and you never know what could happen. That's right. Perfect. Also, and then obviously be willing to move. That's right. Be willing to move. I came here from uh, Minnesota. So the move was not too hard in terms of the weather. But I mean, you know, over the course of five years, I went from eastern Pennsylvania down to Mississippi, up to Minnesota, back to the east coast in North Carolina. So you have to be willing to move. It's expensive. It's pricey. But if you if you want to keep doing it, you will. And fortunately, as you go along, I was a year in Minnesota or excuse me, a year in Mississippi. I was three years in Minnesota. I have a feeling all goes well here in Charlotte. I'll be here for a little while. I've started to set down roots, things like that. And then when the NHL comes calling, when my time is ready, then I'll make that move again. But things start to slow down as far as the move is concerned. Love it. Love it. All right, my friend, are you ready? Yes. All right. Very first question. You go to, um, you go to a hockey game, right? And uh, as a fan, not as a, you know, uh, someone who, as an employee of the team, what is your food and drink of choice? I am a, I'm a soda guy. I love soda probably more than I should. Um, so that's the first thing I'm going to go through. Whether it's Pepsi, Coke, I'm not, I'm not a snob about that at all. I'll take a soda. What I am a snob about is hot dogs. Anyone who's listening to this who knows me from Pennsylvania knows my thoughts on hot dogs. Um I love hot dogs. I have a one note in my computer. Um, we're not shooting the zoom on my computer. Otherwise I'd show you that has a ranking of every hot dog at every arena I've ever eaten at as a play by play broadcaster. And I only eat my hot dogs plain. I, I look down on people. I know this sounds horrible, but I look down on people who put things on their hot dogs because I feel it in, takes away from the enjoyment of the hot dog i can feel every one of your listeners going what is wrong with this guy because i've had this conversation a number of times it's on recording i eat my hot dogs plain um because of the fact that i feel like you're ruining the hot dog by adding all the stuff on top of it enjoy the hot dog for what it is now i will say this because i've gotten yelled at for this but there are instances where it is okay to put toppings on the hot dog. Like if the bun is really, really dry or the hot dog itself is just really not that good, then cover, cover it up with whatever and just get through it. Um, but to the viral video of the guy who poked his straw through a hot dog and is drinking his beer out of the hot dog, that needs to stop. I was so many people commented to me on Twitter last night about that video because it's going viral. Some guy at a Yankees game 
drills a hole through his hot dog and uses it as a straw. That's got, that is awful. That is awful. But to, you know, the long answer to your very short question is a plain hot dog and a Coke. Uh, I'm with you there. I, that whole hot dog and beer thing as a straw that just grossed me out and it needs to go away. Um, also, I am a ketchup and mustard guy, but I will forgive you because I get it. I understand, you know, to each their own when it comes to hot dogs. I am a huge fan of hot dogs. So that's my thing. I go to any ballpark or uh, any arena. It has to be a hot dog. Absolutely. Um, it's it's the sport food of, of sport, right? It's the food of sport. I'm 100% there. All right, here we go. Second question. Have you ever re-gifted a gift? Have I ever re-gifted a gift? Probably not. I am, <laughs> I'm driven by guilt in my life. So uh, I also believe in karma because karma loves to come back around. So if I re-gifted that gift, I would be terrified and nervous that the original person who gifted it to me would find out about that somehow. And I would be morbidly embarrassed. Um, so I don't think I have. And the reason I say I don't think I have is because if I had done that, I feel like I would still remember it because of that guilt hanging over me. And I don't remember anything. So I don't think I've ever I would I'm the type that would more so just shove it in the back of a closet. And then, you know, if they're coming over to the house or something, I would bring it out just just to have it out, you know, depending on what it was. But no, I've never regifted anything. Now, I will say I'm not yet married. so. When we get married, when we get a whole bunch of stuff, will there be some regifting there? Yes, because I will be able to escape the guilt by just saying my wife gave it away. I had nothing to do with that. You are a smart man. I am a married man. And that is the way to go. <laughs> that is the way to go. <laughs> Love you, honey. Uh, OK, what is the most boring sport in your opinion? The most boring sport in my opinion. Let's see. Probably, are we talking watching or go, uh, are we talking like going to it? Watching. Watching is golf, in my opinion. You know, a, a couple things, the, they do the Masters really well, like the preamble, the pregame show. Uh, now they're doing like those those fireside chats, you know, inside the nice in the Augusta clubhouse and stuff. I think those things are really fun and really neat. Um, but the most boring sport for me, I think, would be golf. Maybe, and I'm so, 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 so sorry to the city of Charlotte. Maybe NASCAR to watch because I feel like you could take a nap through the first hour, 45 minutes, and then just watch the final 10 laps. And no, you like, if you're pulling for a certain driver, you're going to know in those final 10 laps, whether or not he's got a chance to win or not. So it's kind of like one of those, all I really need to do is watch the last 10% of that race. I don't need to, to watch the entire thing. So it's, it might be a toss up between golf and NASCAR. That said, I love golfing. I'd probably be terrified to be a NASCAR driver because I, I, I don't do speed all that well, uh, but that would be a lot of fun. Uh, no shame to those guys and no shame to the guys that do it. Like Jim Nance, a wonderful golf broadcaster. I mean, he is a fantastic play-by-play -play broadcaster and all Daryl Waltrip with NASCAR. Like that's a very tough sport in itself to broadcast. N no hate to anyone who works in those sports, but, or is a fan of those sports for that matter. But I think those two are probably the most boring. NASCAR can be exciting if there's a whole bunch of crashes, but you, I don't like to root for the crashes because it's dangerous. You know, Dale Earnhardt, all these guys, things, things can happen. No, no, no. I don't, I don't, I don't need that. I'm with you there, but I, I'm a hundred percent with you. Cause like, you know, I, I'm, I tried to get into NASCAR. I just couldn't do it. Just could not do it. So I'm with you there. And it's just a circle a lot of the times, you know, the most. So it's an oval. So I'm probably not a circle oval. Right. So I'm with you there. Uh, if it was like a road course, like an F1 or something along those lines, that's different. Right. That's that's a little different. Yeah. And I think there's a different skill set there with slowing down, which, you know, NASCAR just seems to be fast, 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 fast. Sure, they slow down around the corners and, and some of the triangular shaped tracks. But when you're doing road courses or you're doing F1, you know, there's a certain way that you got to when you got to apply the brakes, how tight you're hugging, things along those lines. Yeah, that's right. All right. If it could be a fictional character, who would it be? Any fictional character? If I could be a fictional character, who would it be? Um, I'd probably want to be Bruce Wayne. Uh, the guy is rich. 
I'm a night owl, much like him. Um, you know, I, I don't mind the secret notoriety that he gets. Like he gets to look in the newspaper and see Batman, 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 and just kind of sit back and go, that's me. No one knows it. I kind of think that that's, there's something there, but pr probably Bruce Wayne, you know, I mean, he, he's, he's, I, I like the fact that both of my parents are still alive. I love you guys. Um, so I necessarily want that part of the bruce wayne complex but uh yeah for sure bruce wayne he, he's he's got it all he's ab he's absolutely got it all i love it love it okay uh phoebe favorite tv show growing up uh batman the animated series <laughs> <laughs> i've kind of had an idea as soon as you said like you're the fictional character i was like where this was gonna go but you know uh okay a couple more here uh what is your spirit animal Spirit animal is probably a dog, a big, very lazy dog, but a dog that barks a lot. If that makes <laughs> any, uh, that's my spirit animal. Um, my girlfriend and I, we have a very big uh, Rottweiler Mastiff mix and she doesn't do anything but sleep. When we take her on hikes, she complains. And this is basically, that's basically who I am. I mean, sleep. If I could sleep all day, every day, I would. I, I, I haven't done it yet, but I need to enter myself into those sleep contests, you know, where people are like, come, you know, sleep here for 10 hours and give us your thoughts on this bed or whatever. I, I need to do that. Yeah. Some big lazy dog. That is a good job to have. I was like, you know, let's give you uh let's give your opinion on, on uh, what the, you know, this bed is like, you know, all like, oh, wow. I got notes. I got notes for you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Get, yeah. That's easy money. <laughs> all right. Uh Okay. What animal do you think is the biggest party animal? Biggest party animal. Some kind of gorilla, some kind of chimpanzee, a primate of some sort. Like I, I can see a chimpanzee hanging from a chandelier. He's got one arm on the chandelier, solo cup in the other. Chimpanzee. I feel like those guys are up to no good. They're the ones that are like lighting the fireworks off in the backyard like gathering everyone around. Yeah, I'm going to go with the chimp. I feel like they're up to no good, but in a good way, but probably not in a great way. Like fireworks could light the house on fire, but also that's kind of cool. <laughs> True. All right, last question here. What is the worst song ever in your opinion? The worst song ever is Landslide by Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> I've thought about this. A number of occasions. If I never, ever, ever hear that song again, I will be just fine. I don't know why I don't like it. Lee and Mac is okay. Uh, they're not my favorite artists. I'll listen to them. Stevie Nicks is wonderful. I don't know why I don't like Landslide. And honestly, let me take that back. It's not even Landslide by, by Fleetwood Mac per se. Any version of that song. Um... I think Tracy Womack has a version of it. Don't quote me on that, but it's just, no, I just don't like that song ever. I don't like it. I like um, it. So if anyone's listening to this and they would like to torture me or if they capture me, um, any kind of terrorist or anything, just play that song and you'll get whatever information you want. You know my guilt and you now know that I cannot stand landslide. So anybody needs anything from me, there you go. We've just given you two very big keys there it is i love it i love it uh did you thank you so much for doing this this was a lot of fun a lot of good information uh from the broadcaster side right hockey and all of that so i really do appreciate you um doing this uh where can people find you on the socials well yeah first of all thanks for having me on i hope somebody you know out there listening i hope this kind of changes their mindset the way that radio commercial that i heard changed my mindset but i am uh, very active on twitter at tj underscore c h i l l o t at tj underscore c h i l l o t that's my last name tj shalot i'm the play-by-play -play voice of the charlotte checkers here in the american hockey league proud affiliates of the florida panthers you can also email me tj shalot at charlottecheckers.com be more than happy if you're a young into the business trying to figure out your next steps or you would like to get into the business reach out to me on twitter send me a dm or send me an email i'd be more than happy to talk to anybody even if it's something simple podcasting or anything ed you're probably the guy to go to for the podcasting but i'd be more than happy to talk about equipment setups i'm kind of a nerd with that stuff nowadays because i didn't know anything about it when i first got started so i might have gone a little too hard uh 
uh, into learning about it. But uh, I, I love talking with folks. I love offering demo critiques and things along those lines. So please reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to chat. And, and you know what, though? And I got to say, because I literally when I said, I was like, you know, I'm going to branch out and do other sports. And you guys were the very first organization I emailed. And right away, you guys said, yes, absolutely. Let's do it. So when it comes to availability, I, I will 100 percent vouch for that because you guys were right available right away. So I thank you so much for that. No, thank you for reaching out to us. I know you're you're kind of a local guy, so we're we're that makes us feel good knowing that at least our reach is getting out there into the community. And the first thing people are thinking of is Charlotte Checkers. Love it, love it. Thank you so much. And then uh, we'll uh, we'll put make sure to put everything on the notes so that way you guys are following the team, uh, you as well. So thank you again, and then uh, we'll see you around. Awesome, man. Thanks so much. Had a great time. Thank you. Hope you guys enjoy that episode with uh, TJ. Now, make sure you guys are following him as well as the checkers on social media. And if you guys want a way of supporting the team, go to their site and go to the merch site, okay? Buy something from them, a hat, a jersey, preferably a dead hat, just saying. Um, but every little bit counts uh, and, and they will definitely appreciate it. Now, make sure you guys are also following uh, the podcast. Give it five stars and then hit the subscribe button. That way you guys are always in the know when a new episode drops all right so before i go though before i go here's the joke do you know that hockey players love drinking tea their most favorite one is penalty all right all right i'll see myself out all right guys until then keep on grinding and always support the minor leagues see ya This podcast is part of the Curved Brim Media Network. Here are some of the other members of Curved Brim Media. Hi, this is Ed Rivera of the Data Chronicles. Join me as I interview people just like you and players, coaches, GMs on the path that led you to become a fan of the sport. I'm Paul Caputo, and on the Baseball by Design podcast, I talk to minor league baseball teams, designers, and other super interesting people about what these minor league baseball logos mean. And I talk a little bit about ice cream helmets. What's up, Bucketheads? I'm Anna DiTomaso, and each week on the Baseball Bucket List podcast, I speak with a different fan about their favorite baseball memories, what the game means to them, and what's left to check off on their baseball bucket list. Hey guys, this is Patrick Larson from the Minor League Baseball Hat History Series. And in every episode, I go through the history of minor league teams through my personal collection of hats. You can find me on Twitter at at PatLarson1. I hope you guys enjoy. This is Patrick. And Corey. Of BaseballMapper.com. And we have made an interactive map to help highlight all baseball teams from the majors down to collegiate summer leagues. We want to bring you closer to baseball. So get on the site and find a team near you today. Learn more about Curve Brand Media at curvebrandmedia.com.